uh, we rely on, on, the const on the Third, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments insofar as they embody an, a concept of the right of privacy. Your Honor. The 1965 case, Griswold v. Connecticut, gave us one of our most fundamental rights as an American citizen, the right to privacy. Initially, this case dealt with the right of a married woman to use birth control. But in challenging the antiquated Connecticut law, Griswold laid forth the right to privacy and called into question the government's responsibility in regulating the morality of its citizens' choices. This was Griswold v. Connecticut. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, marking what many consider to be the greatest conquest in the history of the women's rights movement in the United States. As the 20th century continued, however, influential feminists fought for their rights in other areas of the law. One such woman was Margaret Sanger, founder of the organization that would eventually be known as Planned Parenthood. Regarded by many as the mother of the birth control movement in the U.S., Sanger advocated for safe and healthy birth control, as well as easy-to-access information on contraceptive practices, believing a woman had a right to choose when to begin her pregnancy. Sanger's progress in the field of reproductive rights for women was not easy. Opposition to birth control information, distribution, and use dated back to 1873 when Anthony Comstock, a salesman, Civil War veteran, and lifelong Christian, introduced the Comstock Act in Congress. Disgusted by the filth he encountered on the streets of New York, he brought forth his namesake bill, aimed at banning obscenity throughout the country. This included literature about birth control and the distribution of contraceptives, both considered obscene by Comstock. Over the next 50 years, 24 states adopted and passed similar obscenity laws. Margaret Sanger was jailed numerous times for violating these so-called Comstock laws while advocating for women's reproductive rights. These same laws were the basis for the arrest of one Estelle Griswold just 40 years later. In 1961, Estelle Griswold, executive director of the Connecticut Planned Parenthood League, made her first attempt to revoke Connecticut's 1879 ban on contraception. Together with a group of young married couples, Griswold challenged the archaic state statute, taking it to the Supreme Court in the case Poe v. Ullman. Their challenge was that the Connecticut law prevented contraceptives in cases where a pregnancy could be harmful to a young woman's health. That challenge, however, was dismissed by the court due to a lack of ripeness to the case. Since no arrests had been made, the court believed the law had not been enforced and therefore had no legal standing as it did not violate anyone's rights. With the 5-4 decision, however, the court appeared divided. With one additional vote, the decision would have been in favor of Griswold rather than against her. It was clear that the climate of the Supreme Court on this issue was changing. The narrow vote in Poe v. Ullman gave Estelle Griswold and her allies hope that the Connecticut statute could be toppled, so they readied a second effort to challenge the law. Griswold, along with Dr. C. Lee Buxton, a Yale professor and licensed physician, began distributing birth control at a clinic in New Haven, Connecticut. They were soon arrested, tried, found guilty, and fined $100 each for violating the state's Comstock law. Now, Griswold had the legal standing she previously lacked in challenging the Connecticut statute. In 1965, nearly three years later, her case appeared once again before the High Court. Griswold's challenge was argued by Thomas I. Emerson, a Yale graduate and influential civil rights lawyer. Emerson's reasoning was that a right to marital privacy was implied by the Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution and the 14th Amendment, the same sentiment that was put forward by Associate Justice John Marshall Harlan in his dissenting opinion in the Poe v. Ullman decision. I consider that the Connecticut legislation, as constructed to apply to these appellants, violates the 14th Amendment. I believe that a statute making it a criminal offense for married couples to use contraceptives is an intolerable and unjustifiable invasion of privacy 
in the conduct of the most intimate concerns of an individual's personal life. The state's defense, presented by Joseph B. Clark, was that the statute was being applied to prevent immorality, especially the use of contraceptives in extramarital relationships. He argued the court should keep with precedent and not overturn past cases under similar premises. Moreover, he said this was an issue for the state of Connecticut to decide, rather than the federal government. This argument of, of using devices uh, to prevent disease seems to me a ludicrous argument. Mr. Clark also drew from a religious foundation, citing Catholic and Orthodox Jewish beliefs against contraception. Defending the large number of religious adherents in Connecticut, he argued their wishes and beliefs would be best represented in the state legislature rather than by the federal court system. Justice Potter Stewart disagreed with this argument. Citing the brief of, of our opponents in, in one instance of the number of uh, Catholics and, and Orthodox Jews in the state, if you were just to put it on a, on a numerical basis... I well, you'd have quite a different case if the, if the state of Connecticut compelled their lawyer, all married couples to use them. That's not... The court eventually ruled 7-2 to two in favor of Griswold, abolishing the Connecticut law as well as other such Comstock laws throughout the United States, making the sale of birth control legal on a national level. Along with this, the decision in Griswold clearly defined a right to privacy, drawing on implicit interpretations of the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 14th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution. In the majority opinion, the seven justices declared a zone of privacy did exist between a married couple. This privacy included their choice of when to conceive and begin their family. Little did they realize at the time, however, this privacy would also extend far beyond the realm of birth control and a married couple's right to choose when to start a family. The right to privacy the Supreme Court identified in Griswold v. Connecticut has become one of the most referenced and utilized concepts in civil liberties cases throughout the decades. After legalizing contraception on the basis of a newly defined right, the Supreme Court extended the zone of privacy to unmarried couples in the 1972 case Eisenstadt v. Baird. Likewise, in Lawrence v. Texas, 2001, the Supreme Court again cited Griswold, Eisenstadt, and the incorporated right of privacy as the basis for their decision to overturn anti-sodomy laws, extending the zone once more to private acts between consenting homosexual individuals. None of these cases, however, compare in scope and controversy to the court's landmark decision in the 1973 case Roe v. Wade. Here the High Court cited Griswold in their majority opinion, stating that a woman had a right to choose in the matter of abortion. The basis for Roe was that a woman's zone of privacy extended to her body, free from government entanglement until a fetus could be sustained by itself outside the womb. These decisions could not have been made without the landmark ruling in Griswold v. Connecticut. Yeah. Griswold laid the foundation for this, this right that inherent in the Constitution, the existing rights in the Constitution, and ultimately inherent as in our rights as people of this democracy. Griswold established that a personal zone of privacy from the government does exist and this right has been further used to challenge the responsibility of the government in its regulation of the morality of its citizens' choices. The benchmark the court established by which we now measure and challenge laws has laid the foundation for some of the most important decisions affecting our civil rights and liberties, and will continue to do so as we encounter new and groundbreaking challenges of our social norms and precedents over the coming decades. The merit of this benchmark is not universally recognized, however. Although Griswold v. Connecticut laid the foundation for our right to privacy, its opponents argue it was a gross overstepping of the Supreme Court's constitutional responsibility of judicial restraint. Those opponents say Griswold is one of the best examples of the court's judicial activism and its legislating from the bench. Regardless, this case remains a precedent and benchmark in assessing American rights and responsibilities.